row major order and column major order are two widely used strategies to store multidimensional arrays in linear storage. In this video, we will look at how they work. Suppose we want to store a matrix of six values directly in computer memory, which is represented as a one-dimensional data structure, so we need to somehow flatten our matrix. Before proceeding, let's first colour the rows to help us keep a handle on what's happening. One approach is to use row major order, a name that stems from the fact that we store the data by flattening along the rows of the matrix first, which looks like this. This way of storing a matrix is also said to use lexicographic order. To see why, let's first rewrite our matrix using subscripts rather than values. For consistency, I'm starting the subscripts from 0, as Dijkstra prefers, rather than starting subscripts from 1, as is more common in linear algebra. When we flatten the matrix in row major order, we can see that the subscripts follow lexicographic order, similarly to how words are arranged in a dictionary. This means, for instance, that A10 comes later in the array than A01, because the first subscript position carries more weight than the second. A second widely used approach to storage is to use column major order. This time, we flatten the matrix along its columns rather than along its rows. This is also referred to as using co-lexicographic order. That's because if we examine the ordering of the subscripts, they now follow co-lexicographic order in which the later subscript positions carry more weight than the earlier ones, so that A10 now appears before A01. Why is storage order important in practice? A key reason relates to the caching used by processors to accelerate their execution. Let's consider a simplified system where we have a CPU, a nearby CPU cache, which is small and fast, and then, in a galaxy far, far away, main memory, which is both large and slow to access, at least when considered relative to the cache. We'll assume that our simple cache has one line of storage with space for three data elements, and that the matrix we looked at previously has been stored in memory in row major order. Now suppose we want to do a task like print each value in our matrix in ascending order. Our CPU begins by looking for the appropriate value for the zeroth cell. It first tries to perform a cache load, but finds the cache empty, an event referred to as a cache miss. This will trigger the cache to perform a slow trip out to main memory, where it will fetch a block of data, in this case the three elements that include the one that the CPU cares about, and put them into the cache. The zeroth element is then fetched, loaded into the CPU, and printed. The CPU now moves its attention to the next position and checks if its value is present in the cache. It is, so the data is quickly returned, loaded by the CPU, and printed. For the next position, another check at the cache yields a hit, so again, the element is loaded quickly back into the CPU and printed. Now we come to the next element. A check at the cache finds that the element is missing, another cache miss, leading to a second slow trip out to main memory, where the block containing the relevant data is loaded into the cache, replacing the old contents. The relevant item is selected, loaded to the CPU, and printed. Since the cache contains the elements for the last two data items, they can be printed without any further cache misses. In total, we've had two cache misses, and therefore two slow trips out to main memory. Now suppose that we perform the same task of printing elements in ascending order, but this time the data is stored in column major order. As before, we must start with the data for the zeroth element and attempt a cache load. The cache is empty, so we dutifully head out on the long trip to main memory to load a block of data and place it into the cache. The relevant data element is then loaded to the CPU and printed. We then move our attention to the next position and head back out to the cache. We have a cache hit, so we load the data element into the CPU and print. Now we come to the next position, 
This time, we can see that, due to the fact that row major order in which we are visiting the matrix elements does not match the column major order used for underlying storage, we have another cache miss. So we must schlep out to main memory to load the relevant block back into the cache, then pass the appropriate item to the CPU and print out the result. We move to the next position and return to the cache. Alas, another cache miss, another trip to main memory to fetch the first block of data and place it back into the cache. The relevant data is then passed to the CPU where it is again printed. On to the next position and back to the cache. Another cache miss, another trip out to main memory where we refetch the second block and pull it back into the cache. We pluck out the data, load it to the CPU and print it. The final element can be printed with no further cache misses. The key takeaway here is that the storage order makes a significant difference to execution time. In our example, row major order has produced two trips to main memory, while column major order has produced twice as many. Since the trips to memory are much slower than trips to the cache, the second program will be far slower than the first one. At the heart of this effect is spatial locality. The choice of row major order for storage means that consecutive memory accesses are always neighbours of each other, and this is what the cache is designed to optimise for. There are also other components of processors that can benefit from having storage that matches the access pattern, such as instructions that load vectors rather than individual data elements. The core idea, however, is similar. Allowing the hardware to exploit spatial locality will speed things up. When working with these storage orders, we'd like to be able to translate between each position in our matrix, which has two rows and three columns and its corresponding location in memory for either kind of storage order. Looking at the position containing the value 3, for example, we can see that it appears at index 3 if the data was stored in row major order, but index 1 if the matrix was stored in column major order. Thankfully, the formulas for these mappings are intuitive. To compute the storage index of the element in row i and column j, the formula is i times the number of columns in the matrix plus j. This simply encodes the fact that storage was constructed by traversing along the rows of the matrix. For each of the i rows we've descended by, we need to add the number of columns, in this case 3, to the total, then account for the offset, j. For our example matrix element containing the value 3, we have i equals 1, j equals 0, so the index is 1 times 3 plus 0, which is 3. To compute the column major index, we flip the formula. It's j times the number of rows plus i, to account for the fact that we are now traversing along the columns. We can repeat our calculation for our running example with i equals 1 and j equals 0, to see that the storage index is now 0 times 2 plus 1, which equals 1. So far, we've talked about two-dimensional matrices, but sometimes we must venture bravely into higher dimensions where visualization is less help. Let's suppose that we have a d-dimensional tensor whose shape is n0 times n1, etc., up to nd-1. Rather than using i and j for subscript indices, we're going to say that dimension d is indexed by the variable id, where id can take values between 0 and n d minus 1, and d can take values between 0 and d minus 1. The formula for the storage index in row major order is now a little more complicated than it was for two dimensions. Here it is. But you can see that it has the same flavour of jumping over dimensions in a particular order, interleaved with adding offsets. One distinguishing characteristic of row major order is that the last dimension is stored contiguously in memory. A common terminology to express this idea is to say that this last dimension moves fastest, in the sense that as you move along storage, the subscript for this dimension will tick along the most quickly. For column major ordering, we get a similar looking formula, but this time it is the zeroth dimension 
that is contiguous and moves fastest. We'll close by noting that different languages and libraries use different conventions to support tensors. Examples of languages that employ row major order include C, C++ when working with C style arrays, and Pascal. Row major order is also popular amongst tensor-based machine learning libraries that are currently widely adopted, such as PyTorch and TensorFlow. There are also many languages that adopt column major ordering, including Fortran, R, MATLAB, and Julia. Some languages, like Java, do not adopt either convention, and instead use alternative data structures for multidimensional arrays, such as ELIF vectors, which use arrays of references to handle multiple dimensions. This is typically a more flexible, but slightly less efficient approach. Many libraries, however, like NumPy, for example, support both row major and column major storage patterns. That's it. We've reached the end. Thank you for your attention.